What's the BMF belt really about? It's a five round fight to determine who is the baddest mother effer here. Touch gloves if you'd like to. Good luck to both of you. Gaethje versus Holloway. We gonna see who is the baddest motherfucker. At UFC 300 coming up, we've got Justin Gaethje, the current BMF title holder, taking on Max Holloway. And before we talk about the fight like we normally do, I kind of want to talk about the belt itself and like where this even came from. What does it mean? It was the great mind of Nate Diaz that started this whole journey. Do you remember how this even like got manifested into existence dean i remember it was nate diaz and he was calling himself the bmf and challenging jorge masvidal because he oh. said that he only wanted to fight another bmf nate diaz didn't want to fight these guys that he didn't never considered bmfs yep. so that was it right yeah no exactly i mean nate Nate had launched into superstardom because I remember a time when like Nate Diaz was considered a good fighter, but not necessarily a super. He was, let's be, let's be real, Laura. He was Nick Diaz's little brother. He was Nick Diaz's little brother and he'd put some volume out and he'd have, you know, some, some fun fights, but like there was, he was not always the star that this latest generation of fans thinks of him as, as being, he was Nick Diaz's little brother. So goes and fights Connor twice, becomes an absolute superstar, makes the most of every single moment on the mic. And he did that after he fought Anthony Pettis because he had the Connor fights. Then he went and he had the Pettis fight, won by unanimous decision. It was a great fight, but he was so smart because he knew that he wanted the money fights. And the money fight in this particular instance happened to be against another guy that really wasn't considered much of a, a superstar at all for the majority of his career, Jorge Masvidal, who had just been Askren his way into superstardom. So Nate being the, the smarty guy that he is was like, man, I'm just going to call it this guy. And I love it because the origin of this belt, I mean, you can kind of take the term BMF and apply it to a fighting style, but you also can kind of with these guys, especially the first two, I mean, they're as close to like actual, I don't want to say criminals, but like, <laughs> you know, street guys, right? Thank you. And then you got the rock, right? Yes. Crazy, That's, right? You got the rock. I mean, the first time that they've ever had a non UFC executive be the one to put the belt on somebody. It, it, it The moment itself was crazy enough, but I'm telling you the walkout Steen. you've got Jorge Masvidal, King of Miami, South Florida. I mean, I'm sure he hasn't, but if I'm being honest, like he would be the perfect guy to play a cocaine kingpin in a movie. <laughs> and then he walks out to Scarface. The arena right. was absolutely electric. And then you got Nate Diaz, this West Coast gangster. Mm -hmm. walked, he walked out to like a mashup of four different rap songs. It was so good. But the one thing that still kind of, you know, is a bit ironic was that it got stopped. Yeah. <laughs> to a cut, you know, like, yeah. come on, if it's the BFF, though, you got to let it go to death. Let him right? go, right? <laughs> let him, let him go to, let him go to the death, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's the way I see it. The doctor shouldn't have, shouldn't have stopped that, but it wasn't like Nate quit, right? Like he was like, no. yo, let's, let's, let's get at it. And what a fight that was. What a, a memorable moment in MMA that was in UFC history. And, it, and it's still, it's going to go down as one of them days in UFC that you're always going to remember. 100%. I mean, it is, it's not Nate's fault. Well, I guess it is Nate's fault for being the type of fighter who has at that point in his career, that much scar tissue built up. But that's how he became a BMF is because he was able to take and walk through so much damage, but it, it piles up over time. And unfortunately, Nate was, you know, at that point in his career, he's just easily cut. And, you know, I'm with you, though. Like, can we just make an exception? Can we just just let this one go. Yeah, let this let this one go a little bit longer. Oh. Right. Like as long as he's 
you know, as long as he's still breathing, yeah. like let him go. So the next installment of the BMF belt, of course, came at UFC 291, Dustin Poirier versus Justin Gaethje. So there was a four year almost, yeah, I guess four year break between the first BMF and the second BMF. I kind of, I thought it would just be a one-time thing. In fact, I think Dana may have at one point said, this is just going to be a one point thing, one time thing. But I think sometimes they get to a point where they, they see a matchup and they're like, this has to be a main event. It, they felt it was felt, it felt very de deserving. Yeah. Like you felt like both guys needed to be in this position. Dustin and, Poirier, Justin yeah, Dustin Poirier and Justin Gaethje. Yeah. Yeah. And you just felt like they needed to be in this position. And the fact that Dustin had beat him the first time and it was such a good fight the first time, but Dustin stopped him. It was, I think, in like the fourth round, but mm -hmm. it, it made it made sense to do it. And it was one of the more exciting fights that you could have made in, in the UFC. Absolutely. So it made sense to do it. And what a smart performance um, from both of them, but in particular, Justin Gaethje, right? Because we've known, you know, I remember watching him in the World Series of Fighting and defense was not like first and foremost in his mind for the majority of his career. I still don't know that it's like the highest priority, but it has become enough of a priority that he is, he still has the danger factor that he developed over that time of just being an absolute highlight reel. But now there's a layer of sophistication and nuance and critical thinking that goes into his offensive attacks that just makes him that much more dangerous as we've, as Dustin Poirier found out. Maybe so I think I think all this changed with him when he beat Tony Ferguson. Agree. I think he learned something like after that first round with Tony Ferguson because Tony had him in a little bit of trouble in that first round, and then he after that, that it was like he turned it on. He did. That was that felt like a pivotal fight for him, and certainly ended up in retrospect being a pivotal fight for Tony in a very different way. And that's you know that's kind of one of the storylines that's now coming into. Uh, this most recent BMF booking, of course, between Justin Gaethje, the current BMF title holder, uh, and Max Holloway, is that Justin Gaethje has that sort of ability to like change people's careers. I would argue, though, that Max has some of that as well. So I guess in terms of how this one came about, um, I think this is this is a fascinating one because now for the first time we have a a a bridge between weight classes, right? We've got Max Holloway who has fought at lightweight one time. He fought Dustin Poirier um several years ago up at 155, but it was on not short notice but sh much shorter notice than this fight. And we've got Justin Gaethje. Um but I'm seeing a lot of talk about you know, whether Max should even be taking this fight. I think a lot of people are putting a lot of stock in the potential size difference between these two. What do you see as the biggest X factor or storyline going into this one? To me, it's not the size. I, I don't think that there's, I don't think size is going to be a factor. I think this is just going to be a, a fantastic fight between between two great athletes. I mean, both of these guys are so good at what they do and when they have great performances and when they are when they're on i mean they are on when max holloway beat calvin cater over there in abu dhabi i was there live for that that was on abc and i remember thinking oh my god this is on abc right now at like two o'clock in the afternoon with little kids watching and it was this, it was one of the worst beatings i had ever seen i was i remember sitting next to dana white there because we were filming dana white looking for a fight and dana was going oh my god somebody needs to stop this like he was literally like concerned with Calvin Cater's health. And that was all at the hands of Max Holloway. So when he's on, he is 100% on. Now he's already a bigger guy. I think that, and I've seen pictures of him. He just looks healthier now at 155. Mm -hmm. This actually might be the weight class for him. So I don't think the size is going to be a big issue. I think this is going to just come down to who is on and who had the best camp who's on that day, Who's was able to avoid injuries. Uh, we know both of them are going to show up and fight to the highest level of intelligence. We do know that. But I think it just comes down to who had the best preparation in camp and who were, was able to avoid injury in camp to be able to give the, mo the most they can out of camp. Yeah, I think I think people don't understand the the massive difference that you can have between 
a, a, a fight up a weight class where you are a, let's say medium sized featherweight and you're going up to lightweight and it's relatively short notice. That's a totally different situation than a Max Holloway who is a ginormous featherweight with plenty of time this time going up to light to lightweight. And when you look at the photos of him from this camp, there's a visible difference like that. Did you see the picture that you took next to Stipe? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he looks fantastic. I, I, everyone's reaction was the proper reaction. There was like either Stipe is smaller than I thought or, or Max Holloway is gigantic. And Max is a big dude. And I agree with you. He just, he looks healthier. And I can only imagine this is going to make him even more durable, which is, I mean, how do you get more durable than Max Holloway? And it's going to allow him to have a camp where he's really thinking about tactics and footwork and not just cardio, 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 gotta, you know, lean out because I don't know what he gets up to in between camps, but I know it's, I've, I've, I know people who have done uh, work with him in the past and uh, 200 is a number that he sees. Didn't he miss weight for, uh, before against uh, when he was going to fight Habib, did he not miss weight when he was going to fight Habib at 155 before? I, you know what? Okay, I'm remembering <laughs> this now. Hold on, I don't think he ever missed, but I, I know what you're talking about. Maybe, maybe but... he got sick and they pulled him. Yeah, but I know, I, mean, I know he had an issue with a with an issue making 155 one time. Yeah, he's I a. Think it was to fight, yeah, it was a short notice to fight Habib. He's a big, big guy, yeah. and. So I agree that with with proper with proper preparation, I think he translates well to 155. In fact, if we want to go to the tail of tape real quick. Uh, record wise, you've got Max Holloway at 25, 7 and 0, 511, 69 inch reach. You've got Justin Gaethje, 25 and 4, also 511, 70 inch reach. So they're basically the same height and have same the same reach. And there's only three years of age difference between them as well. What what do you feel like is going to be the most important factor in this fight? Do you feel like it's just a matter of like who finds their who finds their groove? Or... Yeah, to me, I think I think if one person finds their groove, it's a wrap for the other one. It's just a matter of who finds it first. And I think in terms of finding their groove, that's Max Holloway getting behind his boxing and getting and and forcing this into just a straight boxing match. Like if he can stay as as long in boxing range as he can, as much in boxing range as he can, and forces this into a boxing match, mm -hmm. hands only, he's going to have a major advantage. However, if Justin Gaethje starts mixing in kicks with his boxing, and I think that's what he does almost better than anybody, and it's weird because it's not like a kickboxer. It's a boxer who kicks, which are two different things. And when he starts kicking with it, within his boxing combinations, he is extremely dangerous. And if he can get into that groove, and that's the thing, though, about him. He can actually kick in boxing range. I was just so, going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what's tough about what you're what you're saying is the key for Max, is that even in that boxing range, Justin Gaethje can kick there. It's the weirdest thing ever. When I was highly caught Dustin, you know, Dustin, you know, when Dustin got kicked in the head, it wasn't that he, he missed a blocking assignment. He missed one simple blocking assignment. And the blocking assignment that he missed was because he tried to shoulder roll, mm -hmm. thinking that it was boxing. If... Justin threw a punch. It might have rolled off his shoulder, but that was a kick that went over his shoulder, and it was from boxing range as Justin was sliding back trying to shoulder roll. So that's the thing that makes Justin so dangerous is that he's able to kick in in the middle of his boxing combinations, and especially when he goes like the right leg kick comes back with a left hook. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just so powerful because he whips in and uses the momentum of his hips and, and the kick and the punch. I mean, it's so powerful. And Holloway has to be careful with that. Like, he can't allow himself to get caught off off guard and get hit off balance with a kick and take a big shot up top. Yeah, I mean, just to, it, it would be really a challenge to prepare for a Justin Gaethje fight because he is so dangerous in so many different uh, ranges like you say, yeah. I mean, normally the, the most basic thought when you're facing a guy who's a really good, creative, dangerous kicker is you crowd the space, you crowd the kicker and you force them, like you said, you force them into that boxing range. But to see Justin Gaethje be able to have the dexterity in his hips, not only to land effective leg kicks in almost a clinch range. I've seen him do that. Like he'll have guys like in a in a in a tie plum 
and he's still able to whip his his hip around and kick him in the leg. It is the craziest thing. Yeah, I've seen. I've, I know. I mean, no one really does that like him in MMA. Like he might be the best guy in MMA at kicking from that range. And and it's, it's part. It's probably an underrated skill that he has that not a lot of people talk about because he's just knocking guys out. Mm -hmm. And but he's setting them up by doing that type of stuff. He's taking out their legs by kicking them from in that range and then just hitting them with big power shots up top. But what a savage he is at that. And that's something that Max is going to have to watch out for. So Max is going to have to be really careful about kicks from the, from the ranges. Do you feel like Holloway can eventually get enough momentum? He's not, you know, a one shot knockout type of guy, but he definitely is an accumulative damage type of guy. Do you feel like Max Holloway is, is a guy who could get, you know, chip away enough at Justin Gaethje? Cause Justin, for as good as his defenses are, both of these guys are willing to take a little bit of heat to get their offense off, right? Like the, both of them are hittable in a, in a, in a way. Do you feel like Max Holloway, um, there's the potential that he could chip away at enough damage on Justin Gaethje to actually get a TKO later in this fight? I do think he can. I, I think he has the potential to do that because he is so uh, accurate and he throws with so much volume. And that's the one thing about Justin. We've seen Justin get hurt before. I mean, Justin gets hurt in probably every fight. Mm -hmm. He he takes one or two in every fight where he gets hurt. And that's something that Max can capitalize on because Max, if Max is able to hurt him with a shot, he's smart about not getting countered back right away. Like, Because that was how Justin was able to keep himself in the fight when he got hurt. He'd get hurt, the guy would close in, and then Justin would throw something heavy to keep him off him. I think if Max hurts Justin, he's going to be smart enough to not close in because he understands that it takes time. And he understands that, hey, I'm going to I hurt you now. I'll hurt you again in another 30 seconds. And then I'm hurt you again in another 30 seconds. And then I'm going to eventually put you away. So I think he'll be smart about not trying to, to, to seal the deal so soon and be able to just keep picking away at him if he hurts him. But he's got to hurt him first. Both of these guys uh, can exist in that uh, a fight is almost ending type of energy longer than I think a, a, about any other fighters can. Like there, there's a certain, there's a certain energy that a fight gets to where it's like, oh, you can feel an ending coming. Mm -hmm. Both of these guys are so good at not rushing the finish and just staying right there and not, not getting afraid of that moment, not rushing that moment and sticking right with it. And the the image that comes to mind is when Ma when Max, no look, punched Calvin Cater. Right. And he literally looked at the commentators and cracked Calvin Cater right in the face without even looking. I have never seen someone reach that level of swag in a fight before. It was amazing. Oh, he was in the zone that night, baby. I mean, he was really stunting. And, I mean, that was one of the more impressive performances you'll see in all inside the octagon. And like I said, when Max gets going, I mean, he's going. When he's having fun and he's in the zone, he's going. But that's the one thing about Justin is I never – like, Justin has such a, a kind of a, a crazy demeanor about him that you you sense he's having fun, but he doesn't really show it like Max. Like when no, Max he is doesn't. Having fun, no. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, when Max is having fun, you can tell. But Justin, you can tell he's – you just know he's having fun just because you can't fight that good and not be having fun. Yeah. But – he don't really show it like he's having fun. He still looks like it's it's life or death for him. Yeah, I think it's that's it's a little bit of the like um perfectionist competitor in him. I've never really seen him, I've never heard him like he he's a confident guy, incredibly confident guy, but you don't hear him like glow about his own performances very often. Like he's more of the guy like, you know, yeah, I'm I'm happy with how that went, but like always, always a lot of work. He's always one to give credit to Trevor Whitman, his head coach. Like he's not a big like you know, out, I'm out here swagging in my flow, you know, doing, taking credit, I guess, all the time for the amazing work that he does do. Um, Max, though, like, oh, what an, what an artist. How do you, how do you think this one's going to, how do you see it unfolding, playing out? You know, <laughs> here's my thing, Laura. Blood. I'm, I'm so bad at this. I don't even know why I ever get asked these questions. I'm so bad at it. All week, actually, for two months so since this fight's been announced, I don't know how long it's been announced for, but I was saying Justin Gaethje's probably going to win. Mm -hmm. And then 
today I talked myself into thinking that Max <laughs> Holloway was going to win. How did you? So, what? What? Uh, what? What changed your mind? What did you think about? I just thought that a healthier Max Holloway, not having to cut an extra ten pounds. I always like when a fighter moves up in weight because that says a lot. Because fighters are so adamant about being the bigger guy in the division. Mm. And it seems like that gives them a little bit of confidence. But when a fighter is confident enough to go, you know what? I'm moving up and I'm confident in my skills. Not my size, but I'm confident in my skills. That does something for me for them. And yeah. I always say, you know, this is this is a damn good fighter because they're moving up because they believe in their skills and not the fact that they're going to be the quote-unquote bigger fighter. So today... I'm picking Max Holloway. All right. I'll check back with you. <laughs> See if it changes. <laughs> <laughs> See if anything uh, changes. <laughs> listen, regardless of who ends up with that BMF belt around their waist, uh, it's so cliche, but it's so true this time. We're all going to win in that one. We're all going to be blessed in that one. We're all going to get highlights out of that one. Uh, it's going to be an incredible display. because See what you did there. You like that? Like, I like that. I like the pun. I mean, that was just off the cuff. That was just, that's just. Was game. that really off the cuff? Yes. As I was talking. That sounds like something that you <laughs> was like, I can't wait to pull this one out. Nope. <laughs> nope. That just happened. Um, so regardless, uh, regardless of who wins, you know, neither of these guys is known for their, uh, their own regard for their own personal safety, right? Like they're willing to go out there and put it all on the line. And we, uh, we benefit from that. And we appreciate that so much. And I appreciate you, Dean, always taking the time to talk to me. Well, I appreciate you too. And I just hope that I was able to give something of value and that you guys can really always. use this. Always. Absolutely. And guys, we will have more videos for UFC 300 coming out next week. So stay tuned for that. And by the way, there's always more content on this channel. These videos here that hopefully I'm pointing at. So for Dean Thomas, I'm Laura Sanko. Hit like, hit subscribe. We appreciate you so much. And we'll see you next time.